All right, had to get this thing fired up, get it on my ear first. You ever try to get one of these things on your ear? It doesn't work. All right, this morning, I'm here, you are here, and we're going to look at, uh, Joe asked me if I would talk to you about discipleship. And it's one of those dangerous ones where, you know, he says, whatever you'd like to do, do. And so he gives me opportunity to do whatever I want to do. That's always a dangerous thing, right? Because you don't know what's coming, and sometimes I don't know what's coming either. So we're going to look. Today what I want to do is I want to talk to you about the interplay between convictions and commitment and how it relates to discipleship, okay? And we're going to look at Romans 12, 1 and 2. So if you've got your Bibles, turn there. If not, I guess I get to turn this on. We'll get you, there we go. Romans 12, 1 and 2. And you'll see, as you read this, think about the, the, the idea of the interplay between commitment and convictions, all right? So he says here, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. In the early 1900s, all right, or in the early 1990s, I'm sorry, early 1990s, the authors of a book on contemporary American society wrote in the 50s and in the early 60s, there was much, something much closer to a moral consensus in America. He says there is absolutely no moral consensus at all in the 1990s. Everyone is making up their own personal moral code, their own Ten Commandments. It's like Judges 21-25. Everyone is doing what is right in their own eyes. Okay? And we know some of that today. Truth is relevant. All right? And if it's relevant, then it's whatever you want to make it. Although it's not true, but that's how, how people live. And that's unfortunately how many Christians live as well. Is that we've, we've been bibed our culture... And therefore, we think whatever truth is, then we can go ahead and do it. Whatever feels right to us, then we go ahead and do it. Um, the, the author goes on to say, The Bible is no longer the moral authority for America, and we are suffering consequences because of it. The real surprise here is that evangelicals don't believe that there is such a thing as absolute truth. All right, four out of ten, 40% decide for themselves what is right and wrong instead of going to the Bible. So then there should be no wonder that there is often a little difference between the ethical views and behaviors of professing Christians and those who have nothing to do with Christianity. Morality becomes a matter of one's own personal opinion. So we've got to ask the question, if there's only 40%, what about the other 60%? All right, who believe in absolute truth. Does a belief in absolute truth affect our behavior or change our character? All right, the answer is quite often no. All right, quite often the answer is very little. When we think about convictions and commitment and discipleship, discipleship doesn't just uh, discipleship just doesn't happen, okay? It just doesn't happen automatically. Just because we're saved and we know Jesus doesn't mean that we're a disciple. There has to be convictions that lead us to a commitment to say that discipleship is worthy of it, all right? That there's some benefit to it, okay? Let me read you a couple definitions here that helps me when I think about this. A conviction is a determinative belief, something you believe so strongly that affects the way you live. A belief is what you hold, but a conviction is what holds you. You may live contrary to what you believe, but you cannot live contrary to your convictions. Okay? Just think about this past week, for instance. What are some of the things you did, and ask yourself, why did I do it? Whether you did the right thing or the wrong thing. Okay? Remember, we said you can live contrary to what you believe, but you can't live contrary to your convictions. And as Christians, we ought to be developing biblical convictions, right? You say amen to that. It's not a trick question. It's, it's, it's correct, you know. We should be developing biblical convictions. And I think there's an interplay. If you have convictions, it will lead to or fuel your commitment. Okay? Because if I have a conviction that exercise is the right thing to do, if that's my conviction, it fuels my commitment to do it. I may not be very consistent with it. I may struggle and to get it right and do it all the time. But nevertheless, my conviction leads me to believe I better exercise. It's the same thing with, with eating. How many here don't eat? We all eat, right? Because it's a conviction, it's a belief that we have, something that holds us, that if we don't eat, especially for about seven days, we will die. Okay? So we eat. 
Some of us more than others, some of us less than others, you know. But we eat because that's our conviction. Okay? So when we come to this, when we come to this idea of discipleship, then I think, and I think Romans 12, 1 and 2 is going to help us here to understand that there's a, an interplay between our convictions and our commitment. And if we don't see the benefit in discipleship, we won't do it. We just won't do it because our commitment isn't there. Because the conviction is not there. Look at, look at Romans. Or let me read you now one other definition. To commit. To commit implies the delivery of a person or thing into the charge or keeping of another person or thing. To entrust to another for safekeeping. In other words, what he's saying here is that to commit something to others, if I give this, if I think Josh is worthy for, me, for him to hold something very valuable to me, and I say he's a good man, then I give it to him knowing that he's going to take care of it for me. That's what it means to commit. In the spiritual realm, it means this. Are we willing to trust God with our lives, believing that he knows what's best for us? Okay? If that's not a conviction, it will not be a commitment. See, if it's, if it's not there, if we don't have that belief, if we don't have that conviction, if we don't see the benefit in doing it, we won't do it. And so when we come to discipleship, okay, we are disciples. We're supposed to be discipling others and being discipled ourselves. If we don't see the benefit in that, if we don't believe that it's true, then we won't do it. If it's not a conviction, it won't be a commitment. All right, so let's look at Romans 12, 1 and 2 to try and illustrate some of what we're talking about here. Look at Romans 12, 1. <clears throat> There's four things I want you to see here. As we look at this, I'm going to try and hold this. If you look at first there, he says, Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God. Let's, we'll stop right there. The word there, to urge, means to exhort. Okay? The word exhort means to encourage someone to do something. Paul is trying to encourage the Roman believers to commit their, themselves as a living sacrifice to God based on everything that came before, leading up to this point, getting to Romans 12. Paul is saying, everything that you've heard me say or you've read in my letter, on the basis of that now, I encourage you to do it. The word is used of exhorting troops who are about to go into battle. And here, is, is, here it is a request based on apostolic authority, referring to the whole previous argument. All right, so Paul is encouraging us to do something. Okay? What he's saying here, to go with our illustration, he's saying what went before this in the first 11 chapters should be our conviction now. And if that is our conviction, then this ought to be the commitment that we do. Okay? So Paul says, you know, I tried, to, I tried to think about this. He's trying to talk to us as if troops were going into battle. And that fits the Christian life, doesn't it? I mean, we are. We're in a spiritual battle every day. Every day. If we, if we follow the pattern of the Lord's Prayer and we pray, Our Father who art in heaven, thy kingdom come. Those are fighting words, Right? Those are fighting words. We're going into a battle. So Paul is encouraging us here to do something in order to better fight the battle that we have to fight. Okay? And he gives us, secondly, the, the motivation for us to do it. Look there in verse 1. He says, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God. All right? By the mercies of God. One writer said, The divine mercies are the power by which this exhortation should take possession of one's will. Right, so that as we think about the mercy that God has shown us in extending grace to us through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and sending Him to die, that should motivate us to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. Okay? I mean, think about that. We're gonna, if we're going to make that commitment to do that, then there's got to be a, com a conviction here to, to back it up, to bolster it, so that we will do it. And he says, Brothers, brethren, look at the mercies of God. Look, at not only all that went, went before this, all right, when he talked about in, in chapter 5, for instance, the, the depravity of man and the need for God to send someone to be a substitution for Adam, a second Adam. Then in Romans 6, he tells us how because Jesus died and rose from the dead, that we are free from sin, that we no longer have to sin, that it's a choice for believers. Okay? Then he comes to Romans 7, and he talks about himself a little bit, I think, in there, my, myself personally, and about some of the experience that he had trying to do the right thing but winding up doing the wrong thing and how God will deliver us from that. Then you get to chapter 8 and chapter 9 and the glories that are given us there. And then chapter 10 and the chapter 11, he talks about Israel and what he's going to do there. And we get to chapter 12 and he says, Brethren, if that's not enough, think about the mercies of God. Think about what, how God's been merciful in your own life. And that should motivate us. That should be our conviction to give us a commitment to be, so that we'd be willing to entrust ourselves to God. 
So he says here, he goes on, there's a third thing here, okay? He says here, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God. All right? A living sacrifice. Think about that. One writer said this. He said, Thirdly, we are to present our bodies as a, a living sacrifice to God. Uh, present means to place beside the altar for any purpose. It is a specific act. It's an act that's supposed to be holy and pleasing. And the idea of holy there is to be set apart. We know what holy means. It means to set apart from the, from the mundane, from the day-to-day -day stuff, to be set apart for the extra special, if you will, or to be set apart for God. And he says the word pleasing there, all right, dedicated to the service of God. That act alone, to present our bodies a living and holy sacrifice. They used to come in, when they used to come into the altar, sometimes they would take the sacrifice that would be there and they would tie it to the altar so that it couldn't get away until they, until they went to sacrifice it. That's what he's saying. God is saying, listen, no longer follow your own, your own wills, your own desires, your own pleasures, but, but put yourself on the altar a living sacrifice. Place yourself there. Commit yourself to me and allow me to take control of your life. Okay? And then one more thing here, and we're going to talk a little bit about commitment here, I think. Yep. Fourthly, Paul speaks of this as our reasonable or logical service. Think about that. It's not just something that we do on a whim. It's not something that we do blindly, but it's something that is reasonable and logical. The use of our bodies is characterized by conscious, intelligent, consecrated devotion to the service of God. The word could mean spiritual in the sense of inner or real, rational in the sense of appropriate for human beings as rational and spiritual creatures, rational in the sense of acceptable to human reason in the sense of fitting the circumstances. So when we think of ourselves here as disciples of Christ, and we think of convictions and commitment, commitment in particular here in this first part, Paul says it's, 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 it's logical. It's rational. It's not irrational. It's not something that doesn't make sense. To us as believers, it should be something that makes sense. That when we read it, when we hear it, we say, yeah, that's, that's the thing I should do. I belong to him now. And therefore, for me to give myself as a living sacrifice is not something out of the ordinary. It's something that should be ordinary amen amen so when we think about commitment here like i said discipleship is a commitment and when we think about commitment here all right and we commit ourselves to god offer our bodies to him we're saying that we're offering ourselves not to a value system okay not to a value system or a set of morals okay my parents and their generation were good moral people generally honest chaste sober th and thrifty but they were not necessarily committed to God. Good people, don't get me wrong, good people, okay? But when we say commit ourselves to God, we, we, we're saying not to those things. Because those things will never get us to God, number one. Number two, we should not pursue holiness to feel good about ourselves. Number three, we should not pursue holiness to blend in with our Christian peers. You know, to commit ourselves to God as a living sacrifice to pursue holiness we don't do it just because everyone else is doing it. We do it because it is a conviction based on our beliefs. We should not pursue holiness to avoid the sense of shame and guilt that follows of committing, uh, uh, follows the commitment, committing of persistent sin in our lives. In other words, we shouldn't commit ourselves to God just because we feel guilty. All right? It's the wrong thing to do. We do it, but it's the wrong, wrong way to do it. If we want to please God, we give ourselves to Him because He is worthy of it. Far too often our concern with sin arises from how it makes us feel. Sinful habits, sometimes called besetting sins, cause us to feel defeated in anything. Whether it's in a game of ping pong or in, in our struggle with sin. We've got to ask ourselves the question, why doesn't the absence of Christ-like character have a similar effect on us? Huh? When's the last time you or I got upset because we weren't Christ-like. Think this past week. How many times did that matter to you? How many times did you think about it? How many times did you get on your knees and ask God to make you more like Him? Because what you were seeing was not like Him. 
When we ask, why is that? You know, think about that for a minute. Why don't we mourn? I'm not saying we don't, but why don't we mourn? You know? And I'll tell you the reason why. And we all struggle with it. It is because we are in love with ourselves. All right? I mean, that's the bottom line. That's the bottom line. In this world, more times than not, you and I want to be comfortable. And we don't like to be uncomfortable, do we? We don't like it when God upsets the apple cart a little bit. All right? We want to be in control. We don't want God to be in control. We want our lives to go smooth. I mean, let's admit that I do. I mean, I'll be honest, I do. I don't like the bumps in the road. I'd rather have a smooth road. I like to get up every day and know that my day is planned and I have it all, you know, mapped out and everything's going to go and everything's good. And I get done at the end of the day and I lay down and I go to bed and I think, man, this was a great day. All right? But that doesn't happen too often. I got to be nice. I got to admit, you know, my control of my own life doesn't happen that way. More times than not, there are bumps right from the very beginning. God says, I've got different plans for you. You know? And so... This, this self-love and our lack of control, okay? We don't like disappointment. We don't like not seeing ourselves at the time of trial come perfect or victorious at the other end. Now, I don't know about you. There's been, there's been times when there's been a trial in my life, and I have not come out victorious. Have you ever faced that? It's not much fun, is it? Not at all. We don't like that. I want to be a winner. I want, I want to succeed. I don't want to end up at the end of the day knowing I've failed. But see, God has other plans. And that's what he's saying there. God is saying, I have a plan for your life. But here's what it's going to take. It's going to take a commitment on your part. It's going to take you to commit yourself to me and present your bodies as a living sacrifice set apart to me. Not holding anything back, not keeping any control for yourself, but allowing me to do it. And when we do that, that's pleasing to him, but it means that we have to be patient while God works his plan out. All right? We've got to wait on him. And that's hard, isn't it? We don't like that. Again, that, that's giving up control. Allowing God to do whatever he wants. The key here is that our change of commitment is to offer ourselves, our entire being, to God. We're not able to control what our eyes look at, what our mouth speaks, or what our hands and feet do. If our whole being, including our mind and heart, is not committed to God, holiness of life rarely progresses apart from deliberate acts of the will. While sanctification is gradual in the sense that it continues throughout life, each advance depends upon a decision of the will. Think about that. Think about that last statement. Holiness of life rarely progresses apart from deliberate acts of the will. That's what that is. Romans 12.1. Romans 12.1. It's God doing a work in us, but it's us also saying, God, this is what I want. And I'm willing to give myself as a living sacrifice so that you can work in me, on me, and through me in any way that you want. Hands off. Hands off. A deliberate act of the will. See? The commitment to pursue holiness is first of all a commitment to pursue God in a way that is pleasing to Him. A life of obedience. We must make it our aim not to sin, to consistently make the right choices, and there is no need to ask God to help us when we are tempted if we haven't made a commitment to obedience without exception. You know, God's not just a life preserver. He's not just there for us when sin comes and we're struggling and suddenly we realize we have a need for Him. All right? To go to God and say, hey, God, listen, I'm having, I'm, God, listen, now I, I'm going to turn you on right now because right now I'm having a problem. And I really would appreciate it if you would help me in my problem. You know, and spend no other time going to him. You know, what kind of a relationship is that? What kind of a commitment is that? What kind of a life commitment would that be? You, would you ladies like that if your husbands or your future husband would come and say, hey, listen, I'm, I'm, I want to marry you, but it's only going to be a 50% commission, commitment. Okay? I'll give you Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, but Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and Sunday are mine. You know? Hey, that wouldn't work, will it? That not work at all. God wants all of it, all of the time. And that's the type of commitment we, we should give him. That's what he's saying there. Present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Okay? We talk about worship in a lot of different ways. 
We talk about it in our singing. We like to sing it. We like to pray. We like all that. But here, if it doesn't start here, presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice, then we really haven't worshipped. All the words that we sing, everything that we do, falls short if it doesn't start here. And that's what discipleship helps us to do. That's why discipleship is important. Because as we are being discipled by somebody, there is that accountability there that because we're getting together to hold each other accountable to make sure that we're doing this. See, we need that. We need that. You cannot do this Christian life alone. Okay? We can't do it. You've got to have somebody there to help you. Jesus had 12 disciples around him, and whenever he sent them out, he sent them out in pairs, didn't he? Because the battle was too great for any one person to do it by themselves. He wanted you to be there with at least somebody else. We need accountability. The battle we're in, all right, this discipleship process is a supernatural process. Now, and unless I miss my guess here, I don't know of anybody here who's supernatural, right? If you are, let's see you fly and touch the ceiling. See, there's nobody, you know, nobody here is supernatural. If we know Christ, we come close because the Holy Spirit lives in us, and that's the supernatural working in us and through us. So you see, we need this. I keep looking up for the clock, and the clock's not there. We need this, okay? Now let's, let's go on and look at the second thing here. Well, let me, let me just say this. Let me, let me give just a couple more notes here, and then we'll, be, we'll go on. So let me ask you this. What are your intentions? Okay? Are you as holy as the early Christians? The key to commitment to a life of holiness is the intention to please God in all our actions. If we don't, we will find ourselves making exceptions. You know, just one more time. God, I'm sorry, I, just one more time, I won't do it again. All right? Number two, sin tends to exert an ever-increasing power on us, if not resisted on every occasion. It doesn't matter if the sin is large or small. The principle is that saying yes to any temptation weakens our commitment to resist sin. All right? resist sin. That's why that commitment is so important. How are we going to be set apart if there's not that deliberate act of the will as a believer to say, God, I want you and I want you to do your work in me. And just as much as we need to make a commitment to, to not sin willfully, we also need to make a commitment to put on or clothe ourselves with Christian virtues or character. To take time to develop those things in our lives and to see them work out in our own life each day. Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, Okay? It's not enough. Here, here's some more practical examples here. It's not enough to stop cheating on your taxes. All right? If you're doing that, stop it. But it's not enough just to stop it. The Bible goes on to say that we, we must also learn to share with others. Right? Because what we have is not our own. Some are, okay, good. So I thought for a minute there, I thought, I'm going to get stoned here in a minute. No, we, we're supposed to learn to share with others. God gives us things. He gives us money, the ability to help others. That's what the body of Christ does. We help each other in need. So it's not enough to stop one thing. You've got to learn to do the other side of it, the flip side of the coin. It's not enough to avoid being bitter against those who have wronged us. Okay, we need to forgive as God has forgiven us. And when we do, that will change our relationship with them. All right? I mean, that happens, right? I mean... If you, if you work and you're there and you've got other people around you, sooner or later you're going to butt heads with somebody. All right? Somebody's going to upset you. Somebody's going to do something to you. Somebody's going to say something and offend you. And we could very easily get mad and walk away and say, forget you. But God says, no, you forgive them, and then you love them just like I love you. Now, that's hard. I've got to admit, all right, that's hard. That's not easy. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, God puts people in your life and and. and and creates that kind of tension there because he's trying to help us develop these Christian characters. If we make that commitment, he's going to do it. Listen, I've told this story here before, but I don't think there's very many here who's heard it. I can tell by who's here. There was a guy, when I was pastoring down in Tarpon, I had a gentleman come in, and he sat down at my desk, and we started talking, and he said, Pastor, he says, he says I want to grow as a Christian. He says, I want you to pray that God will grow me. So I said, okay, be glad to, you know. Why would I turn down an opportunity like that? So I prayed for the guy. And, and I prayed, and about four weeks later, no kidding, about a month later, he came in, and he said, Pastor, he says, I want you to pray and ask God to stop. <laughs> because God was doing the work, and it was hard. It's hard to change. God wants us to change, and he wanted it to stop. Why, you know, 
I said, sorry, I, I, you know, God very rarely listens to me. And so if I say, you know, stop, that's up to him. That's not mine. That's his call. You got to deal with him. But that's, it's painful because God is going to change us. If we pray that way, it, you know, it's the old, the old saying, if you pray for patience, then God's going to bring troubles in your life so that you have to exercise patience. And he's going to do it. And that's why we have to be careful that when we make a decision like this, because it is logical and rational, it has to be a deliberate act of the will. We can't just do it on a whim. We've got to do it because we really want God to make a change. So it's not enough to pray that God will enable us to deal with a volatile temper. We must also ask him to help us put on compassion and kindness. In other words, we need, not, we need to not only make a commitment to deal with all the sin in our lives, but we must also make a commitment to put on the fruit of the Spirit. You remember Job in Job 31.1? Job says there that he prayed. In fact, I think I have that. I probably have more up here than I realize. Hold on. At Romans 6, 13, do not go on presenting your members, the members of your body, to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. Think about that. That's an option that we have. That's a choice that we can make. That's what he's saying here. Stop doing one thing and start doing another. And he wouldn't tell us to do it if we didn't have that option, right? Job 31, 1, I have made a covenant with my eyes. How then could I gaze at a virgin? In other words, he was praying that God would help him not to lust after other women. And we look at Job. Job was a man of faith, right? Job was a man who went through it and came out on the other end good. And here he is making a commitment at that level. Let me go back to where. So as we look at this, there has to be that commitment. There has to be that, that in our understanding, there has to be that bottom line that says, I trust God to do with my life as he fits, and I know he will do only good, and I am willing to do it. I mean, that's the whole thing about getting saved, isn't it? I mean, when we get saved, it comes down to we hear the story, we believe that the story of Jesus is true, we know that we are sinners, and it comes to the point where we have to say, I am willing to commit my life to Christ because I need his, re his saving work. Amen? Amen? And if we do it there, that's the way the rest of the Christian life goes. It doesn't stop there. It's not a one-time commitment. It is a, it is a commitment that lasts a lifetime. God not, is not only good enough for us to trust him to be saved, he's good enough to carry us along so that we might live the Christian life the way we should, so that we might become more like Christ. Okay? So let's look at verse 2. Let's look at verse 2. He says there, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Notice he says, listen, if you make this commitment to Christ, then there's a twofold response that's going to take place here. God is going to do something, but you have to do something as well. First, Paul tells us not to be conformed to our culture. Okay? He says, do not be conformed to this world. This literally means not to let our culture form us or mold us into its image. Okay? In other words, it's, a, it's a, almost a, in a permissive sense. What Paul is saying here is do not give permission to the world to change you. All right? It, in, it indicates a discontinuation of an action in progress. Stop allowing the culture to shape you. Paul assumes that there are only two alternatives from which our convictions can come from. The culture around us or they will come as our minds are transformed and renewed by the Word of God. The truth is that, that we believers are probably being influenced by both society and the Word of God. Okay? And what happens when that takes place? What happens when culture tries to shape us and when the Word of God tries to shape us? Say it out loud, Josh. Confusion. That's right. If there's not this commitment to pursue God and Him alone, and we try to let both culture and the Word of God do it, we get confused. And I see that in, in young people today. Up at the college when I talk to students, okay, you can see that in their value system, their convictions. What do they hold? For instance, abortion. Young people today, young Christians today struggle with that because they hear the world say, you know, oh, we ought to go ahead and let abortions. Why? You know, I remember... And we heard a president here recently say that abortion was okay. That to be anti-abortion was, it was the way we used to think. But now, if we're going to be 
keep up with the time, so to speak. You know, if we're going to be, 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 be considered uh, believable by those, then we should believe that abortion is okay. And then they go to church and they hear the church say, abortion is wrong. And they say, okay, what am I supposed to believe? And so they try, what they try to do is fit the two together. And you can't do that. You can't fit what God's principles and the world's principles together. They don't work. They don't mesh. They're not made to go together. They're opposed to one another. Okay? And that's just, that's just one illustration. You know? We struggle with this kind of stuff because we are being conformed to the world. We look around at the world. Uh, I just preached a sermon at, in chapel on Psalm 73. And there the psalmist is looking at the world and he says, man, he says, here I am as a Christian. He says, I'm trying to live life right. I'm doing all the right things and yet I'm struggling. You know? And he looks around at the world and the wicked and they're prospering. And he says, I don't know if this is such a good deal. We do the same thing. We do the same thing. Adults do the same thing. You know? But it's because we have not made that commitment nor formed the convictions that we're going to talk about here in a minute in order to not let the culture shape us to be impervious to what the culture is doing so that we can follow God. So that our discernment might be, I know that's wrong, and I'm not going to listen to that. This is what I'm going to do. You know, it's almost, i got to be honest, it's almost no fun for me to listen to the radio anymore. Because either, either the talk show I'm listening to, what they're saying is, is pure malarkey, or when you listen to the songs that most of the radio stations, you're not listening to Christian songs, you're listening to uh, country western or something like that, I like to keep up because I know I have students that do it. They are terrible. They are. And it's not just country western. You can listen to rock songs. You can listen to content of what they're saying. It is terrible. You know? And I, I don't enjoy it. It irritates me because I know what God wants us to be listening to and how he wants us to treat ourselves, and we don't do it well. Anyway, let's move on. What determines whether we are moving to the right or to the left? Our attitude to the Word of God. Okay? Our attitude to the Word of God. Nothing else will determine where you are on that continuum. The psalmist indicates that in the, it is the one who delights and meditates on the Word of God that is moving in the right direction. And you remember what meditate means? Somebody tell me, what does meditate mean? Huh? What does it mean to meditate? It means to think on. It means to say it out loud almost. It's like a cow. A cow, a cow will eat, and it goes down his digestive system, comes back up, he'll chew on it a little bit more, and goes back down his digestive system because he has like four stomachs, so I guess it's got to go through. I don't understand how it just keeps coming up, and he keeps chewing on it. All right? That's what meditation is. We think about it. We might, in our minds, we talk about it. God, what does this mean? How, how is this supposed to happen? Why am I supposed to do this? How am I supposed to meditate on the Word of God? What is, and we keep asking questions. And when we do that, then we're meditating. We're thinking on it. Okay? And that's what God wants us to do. Psalm 1 tells us that. That the man who meditates on the Word of God is a happy man and a blessed man. Ask yourselves, where does your mind go when you can think of anything you want to think about? What is it that you think about? Meditation on Scripture is a discipline, and we must commit ourselves to be proactive. How else, how else can we keep our minds on things? We're going to talk in a minute here. He says, do not be conformed to this world. And that word conformed there, by the way, is a passive verb. Passive means that the culture is trying to act on us. All right? The conforming part is the world trying to conform us, trying to get us and make us to what it is. But he says, rather, he says, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And guess what? That word transform there is a passive verb too. And it's saying there, but let yourselves be transformed by God as you renew your mind. And how do we renew our mind? We renew it through the Word of God. We renew it through Scripture memory. Taking it in, meditating on what that means, thinking about it. You know, taking seriously what God says when He said, man does not live on bread alone, but by every word that is spoken from the mouth of God. Or what Timothy said, the Word of God is God-breathed and is profitable for. And he lists all those things. Do we really believe that? Do we really believe that? Is that something that is a conviction of ours? Or is that just something that, eh, you know, maybe, maybe not. I mean, ask yourselves. Don't raise your hand. Don't tell me. I'm not wanting to find out. But ask yourself, how often did I read my Bible this week? Did I try to memorize any scripture this week? Did I meditate on any of this? 
How much time, if I really believed it, how much time did I spend doing? I guarantee you, weigh it against the time you watch TV. You want to see where you're at? My iPhone now, and I didn't ask it to do this. For some reason, it's doing it on its own. It tells me how much time I spent staring at the screen. Yeah, yeah, I say, I don't want to see that. You know, you're lying. I don't believe you. You know? So ask yourselves, how much time do I spend staring at the Word of God, meditating on the Word of God, trying to memorize the Word of God, compared to other things that I do? You know, if we really believe that it's true, if, we really, if that really is a conviction of ours, we want to see ourselves transformed. The transformation here is an inside-out transformation. Conformity to the world is an outward thing, where they try to squeeze us into their mold. This kind of transformation is an inward thing, in which God is working. Okay? God is working as we give him permission by faith, come to him, we say, yes, Lord, I want this, and allow him to do it. You know, what, what end of the continuum do we want to be on? Do we want to be on this end, where the influence of God and his word is great, or do we want to be down here where the culture is conforming us? The result of the formation of these convictions comes by testing. Notice what he says. He says, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove or test, prove what the will of God, prove to be acceptable. That's what that word means. It means to test it and to find it right. So God says, listen, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Take my word in and test it. Take my word in and prove what the will of God is. See if it's not there. You, you know, what God asks us to do, he never asks us to do blindly, right? It's not a blind step. He gave us his word, put it to the test. Apply it in your life. See if it doesn't work. See if he's not correct. Because then he says you can prove the will of God is that which is good, acceptable, and perfect, or complete. Right? If we're looking for what is good in this world, if we're looking for what is good in our own lives, this is it. You want it? Here it is. We have a good God who wants to provide good things for us, and it begins with the transforming, renewing of our minds. So test them. I think I have another scripture up here. We go far enough. Yeah, Proverbs 1, 1 through 7. Read, with, read this with me. It says, The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to discern the sayings of the understanding, to receive instruction in wise behavior, righteousness, justice, and equity, to give prudence to the naive, to the youth, knowledge, and discretion. A wise man will hear and increase in learning, and a man of understanding will acquire wise counsel. To understand a proverb and a figure, the words of the wise and their riddles. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Look, this is Proverbs 1. Look at what it says. You want to, if you want to know how to live in this world, want to get some practical instructions, here it is. This is just an example. He says here, it's to know wisdom and instruction, to be able to discern the sayings of understanding and to receive instruction in wise behavior. You want to know how to live? You want to know how to make decisions? You want to know how to do right from wrong? Right there. Read the book of Proverbs. And he'll give it to you. That's the whole point of the book of Proverbs, is to help us in our daily living so that we do the right thing. See? And he says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord. I don't think I have anything after this. But I do. Proverbs 2 1 says, My son, if you will receive my words and treasure my commandments within you. Treasure. You know, how important is it to us to know the Word of God? If you go on and read in chapter 2, it talks about trying to find it and that you search for it like gold and silver. All right? Does it hold that kind of value for you and me? Forget the world around us. Forget your neighbor. Ask yourself, does the Word of God, does this commitment... And being able to make my own convictions based on the Word of God, how important is that to me? 
on a scale of 1 to 10, or what I put up here, number, the highest thing, what is it that you value the most? And where does the Word of God come into play? If it's not number 10, then what is it? All right. Let's close with this. I say all that to say, this is why the discipleship process is so important. Because if, if you want to grow as a, as a Christian, if I want to grow as a Christian, it has to come through the discipleship process. I can think back to my own life when God saved me back in 19, and I'm not going to tell you. He saved me. There were, there, was a, there were two gentlemen that came into my life, and they discipled me. And I'm telling you, it made all the difference in the world for me. I met with them just about on a weekly basis. I was over at their house. We were talking about the Bible, reading the Bible, praying together. My knowledge of the Bible increased exponentially simply because I was there with them. Okay? It gave me a hunger for what the Bible had to say and to understand it. Because not, I saw it in their own lives. It was a conviction to them, and they made it a conviction for me. Let me ask you, who do you have in your life to help you do that? And if you don't have anybody, get somebody. Look around you. We've got books over there that the pastor has said, if you want to be discipled, we'll find somebody. We'll either do it or we'll find somebody to do it for you. Okay? But don't let it go. Don't let it go and not be discipled if you've got the opportunity. Or disciple somebody yourself. Maybe you say, well, I've been discipled. Well, good, now it's your turn. Disciple somebody. Help them to gain that hunger for the Word of God. Okay? Second thing is, where's the Word of God in your life? How important is it? I mean, if you've been a Christian for very long, we have our ups and downs, right? I mean, I mean, sometimes it goes, we're hungry and we really thirst for it and we're in there and we're digging. Other times we forget and we're not consistent and there's just that up and down in life. That's just the way we are. All right? Where are you at now? You know, when, at school, I can guarantee you, when students come to me and they say they have problems, more times than not, I'll, I'll ask them, I'll say, all right, are you having your quiet time? Are you in your Bible? Are you reading and praying? And nine times out of ten, they say no. And so we start there, and we begin to build on that. And usually, once we get that, and they get consistent, and they're, they're having a relationship with God, things start going pretty good. Suddenly, there's not the problems that they were having before because they're in that relationship with God. They're in the Word of God, and they're being fed, they're being nurtured, and, and they move on. Where are you? Where are you? You know? Do you really see that what we're doing here, whether it's through discipleship or church or whatever it is, do you really see it that it is beneficial to you? Does it bear fruit in your life? Is it really something you want? Or are you just here on every Sunday just because that's what we do every Sunday? We show up, we sing, we hear preaching, we pray, we go home, things are good. Life is, life is great. You know? My challenge to you is to do this. If that's where you find yourself, you ask God. You say, God, change me. Change me. Grow me like that gentleman did that he, when he came in my office. Make a difference in my life. Don't let me stay where I'm at. I begin every day. Every day, my prayer is this. God, I thank you for the day, and I thank you that I'm a part of it. And I know that this day is yours, and I pray that you use me any way you see fit in, in this day. I don't, whatever comes my way, you help me to see it from your hand. Good or bad, doesn't make any difference. That's the way I begin my, my day, every day. I pray about the same thing every day because I know God is in control of it and I want him to be in control of it and I want to be used by him. And that means that whatever comes, good or bad, I know it's from God's hand. And I want him to teach me from it and help me to respond in a way that is pleasing to him. That's my commitment. I commit because my conviction is what God brings in my life is good. Always good. See, I have that conviction. And because I have that conviction, it fuels my commitment and I'm willing to do it every day. And I'm telling you, it's not always been smiles every day. It's not always been easy every day. There's bumps. There's bruises. There's people offending me. And I have to love them anyway. All right? But that's what God wants me to do. That's what makes me more like Christ. And that's worth it. Amen? All right, at this time we're going to have the Lord's Supper. So I'm going to get Josh to come on up. I'm going to ask Nate to come up and play, and we're going to pass out the elements. And I want you to think through what you've heard this morning, what you've read in Romans 12, 1 and 2. 
And I want you to think about, God, where, where am I at in my commitment to you? And help me to develop godly commitments. Take a moment, think about that, and pray about that, and we'll pass out the elements.